So I wanted to uh, do this talk and just as early on in the year, I wanted to go through uh, some uh, non-ACS uh, examples of chest pain and also just go a little bit into the treatment of ACS, particularly focusing on end stemmies because that's, those are some of the bread and butter that you guys will be dealing with most frequently. So yeah, so let's get, get started. <clears throat> Okay, great. So starting with ACS and you guys by now have had, um, I would imagine at least some patients with true ACS. We have a lot of mimickers out there, but nevertheless, we all know about the squeezing pressure-like sensation that would be the typical presentation. Um, and uh, diaphoresis, nausea, shortness of breath, that's more of the classic presentation. There's variations in older folks and diabetics and women sometimes. So you have to, you do have to be a little bit uh, more nuanced with the history a lot of the time, but this is the classic presentation and obviously the elevated biomarkers and the abnormal ECG. And I wanted to really focus on the ECG a little bit here. Just looking at this ECG, this is a giving you the answer here. I know that we had done the uh, EKG lecture previously. So the EKGs that I show you now, I'll give you the answer I want. I won't ask you, but I will show you the relevant points here. So you look at this EKG right at the onset. So this patient is having chest pain, and uh, this is on the field by EMS. And you can see that not much in terms of ST elevation. So there are some parts of the EKG that might seem a little bit concerning. I mean, you have the ST depressions here. Uh, ST depressions and T-wave inversions here uh, and so forth in the precordial leads, uh, but, but nothing that would qualify for a STEMI. So the patient then 17, min 17 minutes later has another EKG and uh, worsening chest pain. Uh, and you can see here uh, very obvious uh, ST elevations here. And that really gives you a sense of how dynamic a process this is. Um, and just because you have the one EKG to begin with doesn't that doesn't really necessarily get you uh, give you an out of jail card per se. So it's something that needs to be monitored. But nevertheless, you know, in the Dr. case Vargas. of STEMI, yep, go ahead. Um, hi, this is amateur rheumatologist um, looking at, at these kinds of things. In ABR, <laughs> should you get excited about um, an elevation like that in the first EKG? Yeah. So, you know, ABR is a little bit uh, non specific, you know. And I think that the way that I consider AVR is, I think it's really relevant when you have evidence of ischemia elsewhere. Very rarely would you use it as a standalone uh, concerning feature because it tends to be nonspecific in that setting. Having said that, in the context of diffuse ischemia, uh, significant AVR elevation that starts to give you a sense that you're dealing really with proximal disease, which, is, which might be what you might have been alluding to. Uh, and, um, but yeah, that's a really that's a good question. So yes, in the right context, it can be significant. Okay, great. So then that's, you know, uh, and we'll get a little bit more on the end STEMI side, but this patient, uh, went for, uh, this patient actually did have proximal disease, uh, more than one vessel. Anyway, they went, uh, for PCI, which is the right treatment for STEMI. If there's a center that's capable of doing so. Uh, you guys also, I'm sure by now, have heard of the option to do a thrombolysis, uh, which we don't use so much in the MedStar system because of the availability of, um, uh, of quick transfer for a cath and, and PCI. So then moving along to just, just briefly touching base on some um, uh, important non-ACS um, causes of chest pain. And uh, some of these by now you've, you would have already seen. Uh, some of them are more cardiac in nature, although it's not so much. But it's just important uh, just to have a little bit of a broad differential. So we'll go through some of these and a few perils and so on, on all, all of these. If, any, if anybody has something to add about them, any recent experiences, we can discuss them as well. Uh, and then after this, we'll go into the end stemming just to hit some of the very important uh, therapeutic options for end STEMI that I want you guys to start being familiar with because you'll invariably be dealing with one end STEMI of one sort or another uh, during your tenure. So I ordered the section. I think we've all heard uh, the tearing and ripping sensation and just this acute, very intense chest pain with radiation that can vary a little bit, but the classic teaching is to the back 
can also be abdomen and neck, depending on where the lesion is. Uh, so things that you see clinically, uh, I put in here the blood pressure difference between the arms, but, and, and I think that's more common. The other thing people may not realize is also looking at the pulse between the upper and lower extremities. If you look at um, uh, femoral pulse, uh, a brachial pulse, for example, and you might see a difference there. And again, this all depends depends on where the, the section is, how uh, extensive it is, and so forth. Another thing that might be uh, present is an AI murmur, again, depending on the extent of the, um, the section. And the EKG can be nonspecific. Uh, you can have ST depression, ST elevation, T wave inversions. And it's important to know that depending on the extent of the, the section, uh, the coronaries might actually be involved as well. So that might dictate some of the EKG findings that you might find. Uh, so, yeah, that's just something, some of the general pearls for, pearls for aortic dissection. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we will, uh, uh, you know, often see uh, people with connective tissue disorders, uh, for example, um, Marfan syndrome, and that's uh, folks are at reasonably high risk of dissection uh, in that category. But then male gender tends to be a risk factor as well, obviously prior cardiac surgery, uh, cocaine is always a problem prior dissection as well. So those are the, uh, some, of, some of the most common hypertension, you know, people with hypertension as well. It's not in there, but it's obviously an important component as well. Uh, it can be confused with ACS, and that's a bit of a problem. It's one of the reasons I have it on this talk, uh, because obviously, uh, as we'll see later, when you talk about end STEMI management, somebody with chest pain and so forth, sometimes uh, there's things like aspirin, Plavix, uh, heparin that are given to folks. And that's something you definitely don't want to do in this setting uh, because that could really increase the risk of uh, adverse outcomes, as you might imagine. And it's also something that can be hard to diagnose. Uh, and uh, some common and correct uh, diagnosis include pulmonary embolism, musculoskeletal strain, and things along those lines. And that just really depends on, the, on, on how the patient is describing their symptoms and, uh, and the history taking and how easy or complicated that might be, depending on the particular circumstances. Uh, yeah, so let, so yeah, so that's a, uh, let me know if you have any questions about that. So it's a brief overview and we'll get through some of the other ones as I mentioned, but pericarditis, pericardial tamponade. Uh, so, you know, that's more common uh, than one might think. And uh, Usually it's a sharp pleuritic uh, chest pain, usually preceded by some sort of a viral prodrome. Doesn't have to be. Um, and um, I know Sean and I have a few patients in common in this area, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't have to be. But, but, but it's something, it's just important to, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with this kind of chest pain, it's important to probe a little bit, you know, and just see if there was any viral illness beforehand, because that could really point you in the right, in the right direction. And uh, unfortunately, most of the cases, we just don't know what's causing it. And uh, a lot of these folks, we do extensive work, work up on them and nothing really uh, comes up. And right? that's just the reality of it. And you might wonder if we're, if we're not testing the right things. You know, a lot of times we presume that it's a viral infection and obviously we can't test for every virus. Uh, so, so that's where we end up thinking in the idiopathic cases that it might be due to. Uh, but obviously things like post cardiac injury syndromes can give you that, rheumatologic conditions of many different um, uh, eating causes and etiologies could be responsible in a case like this as well. But it's just something to just really keep in mind, uh, particularly because historically you'll have the sh sharp pleuritic chest pain, which can give you a sense of other things that might uh, be going on, but then that should be a clue to kind of get a sense of, okay, was there any, any viral prodrome or anything that might lead me to to a potential pericarditis type picture. Uh, very brief overview, but I did want to show you, uh, be remiss not to show you this kind of EKG here. Uh, and this is acute pericarditis and you can see there, uh, again, I'm giving you the answers today, but, <laughs> uh, but you can see the diffuse ST segment elevations uh, throughout there and PR depressions as well. And obviously the patient is also tachycardic. You know, so the tachycardia, uh, ST elevations that are diffuse, as well as diffuse uh, PR depressions. And in the history that we just talked about is diagnostic for, for pericarditis and usually the main uh, treatment after you do the appropriate diagnostic uh, 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 pathways uh, would be to uh, do non-steroidal uh, uh, anti-inflammatory agents. And this here is 
when things get very bad. This is uh, tamponade. The video, uh, this is more of a still frame, but it still shows some of the aspects here. So obviously you have the pericardial effusion here. For those of you that are not familiar with uh, echocardiogra echocardiographic images, this is a subcostal view, that's the liver up here. Uh, this is the four chamber of the heart. Uh, and what you can see here is the left ventricle. Uh, this is the right ventricle, which you can't even see it uh, because the pressure from this fluid around the heart is really uh, pressing down on the right ventricle. So that in diastole, when the right ventricle is supposed to relax and fill with blood uh, coming from the right atrium, is not able to do so. And it's that pressure and that uh, uh, impediment of filling on the right side that starts to give you a, a classic tamponade physiology uh, that we are used to, uh, uh, to seeing. So obviously, in a case like this, then what you'd have to do is um, uh, drain this uh, immediately, emergently, and uh, we can do this percutaneously and then um, do some of the treatment and diagnostic uh, procedures that we discussed before. So another thing to keep in mind, this is not as common, but in the right context, it can be very common, uh, relatively speaking. And that is uh, esophageal perforation. I, I don't know if, well, I'll go through some of this and then I'll tell you an anecdote. But so the risk factors, and, and this is one of the reasons I bring it here is uh, recent instrumentation and trauma. Um, and uh, something that you'll never forget if you see, if you see it in this context is subcutaneous emphysema, uh, uh, Hammond's crunch. And then there's the macular striad, the chest pain, vomiting, and subcutaneous emphysema. One of the reasons that I put this here is because, particularly in centers where you do a lot of endoscopies, uh, it's just very important to know about this differential, particularly somebody that just had an endoscopy, right? Uh, and just know that you might have the chest pain, that if you do it on an exam, and, uh, and what I saw as a fellow, as a cardiology fellow, was a patient coming in um, uh, in septic shock uh, after having had a uh, transesophageal echocardiogram as part of um, uh, anesthesia had done that as part of cardiac surgery. And uh, the patient had, had a very severe subcutaneous emphysema involving all, all of their neck. So you could really hear the crunching as you pressed uh, uh, the skin of the neck. And that's something that is pathobagmonic for esophageal rupture uh, in the context of a procedure, which is the most likely scenario in which you might be able to see that. And we have learned when we're doing things like um, EGDs and uh, TEEs and, and things along those lines that chronic steroid use can be one, a predisposing uh, risk factor in the context of a instrumentation to potentially lead to this. And that was the case in that, in that uh, patient that I was involved um, in their care in the post uh, uh, rupture care. But that is just something to know, uh, obviously not as common, but again, when you do have instrumentation, it can be something that you, that you can see. Um, all right. Obviously, PE is something that by now you guys are very familiar with, and you guys know about the sharp and pleuritic chest pain. Uh, you know, the one thing that I'll say about it is that it can be very varied, very subtle. Uh, it can often lead to misdiagnosis, and it's very high stakes. You know, the mortality can be 15% uh, in three months or even more. Uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, for pulmonary embolism, uh, you know, they, you know something. So just to give you a, a little bit of a sense of what other things might cause this, but uh, what other symptoms might be present. But chest pain, uh, we know as we talk about dyspnea makes sense, right? Uh, hypoxia is something else. Something that people don't necessarily are, are they are not necessarily aware of is syncope. Uh, so it is part of the workup of syncope, and we do once in a while see patients at their main presentations for ha having significant uh, uh, thromboembolic uh, disease is syncope and not really much of the other things. Just keep an eye on that. Other things, hemoptysis, I don't see that so much in a setting of PE, but something to be aware of. And obviously, uh, card you know, uh, cardiovascular collapse, that's certainly in the differential there. And as we know, hypercoagulable states, recent surgeries, uh, and recent travel, smoking, and uh, exogenous steroid, uh, ex exogenous, uh, sorry, estrogen use can also be a risk factor. <clears throat> Pneumothorax, uh, something that we see uh, either a lot of or not as much of, depending on the, uh, on the context. But as you guys know, the sudden uh, pleuric chest pain or shortness of breath with, and shortness of breath, the so things like trauma, obviously, uh, can, can be a risk factor, pulmonary disease as well. 
<clears throat> connective tissue disorder, cystic fibrosis, uh, positive ventilation, and sometimes <clears throat> uh, lead to this. So that's something that obviously in the in the units uh, they keep a close eye in, on. <clears throat> uh, after certain procedures as well, uh, so, such as uh, chest placements or pacemaker placements, we keep a close eye for pneumothoraces as well. And it's, you know, the presentation is <clears throat> these decreased breath sounds on the affected side. And that's really something to keep an eye out for because it actually is, can be very striking. Tachycardia as well, <clears throat> uh, palpable uh, subcutaneous emphysema, like we talked about with, uh, 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 with the esophageal rupture, but it would be in a different place anatomically because you would have it uh, mostly around the area where uh, it's affected. And uh, in, this, in the case that you have a tension pneumothorax, then emergent decompression. And there's, the, there's a little bit of controversy as to where you put the needle and so forth. But uh, the, you know, the overview is that decompression in that context would be uh, adequate. And then, so that's just, just to give you an overview uh, of different causes of chest pain that are fairly acute. And some of them you may be more familiar than others, but keeping them all in mind, I think is beneficial. And uh, I wanted to turn a little bit more towards the treatment of ACS, particularly and STEMI, because that might be the type of ACS that you're more uh, directly involved in. Because, you know, if it's a STEMI, that's a pretty pretty clear pathway, particularly at MedStar, and that's just to get the patient cath as much as possible, as long as uh, they're candidates for that. Uh, and STEMI, you have a little more wiggle room depending on the clinical scenario. And it's important to just be uh, aware of what we expect in terms of medication treatment and, uh, and what the data shows is, <clears throat> is the way to go. And <clears throat> at least in cardiology here, where when we look at different levels of evidence, uh, you, we divide it into classes, right? So class one would be the biggest benefit. Class two would be most benefit compared to risk. Class two B <coughs> would be more of a, of a tie, right? That's the kind of recommendation uh, that you might follow, you may not follow based on the clinical history, right? So class one, you definitely do. Class two, you generally do for the patient. Class two B, maybe. Class three, you do not do. And that's basically to give you a sense of how to look at the different levels of evidence. When you look at the letter, whether it's A, B, C, that depends on the actual number of studies and the level of evidence. So if you have a class 1A, that is a very strong indication to do that therapy for the patient. When you look at class uh, 1B, that's less. Class 1C, that is less. But generally speaking, class 1 would trump that, if that makes sense. So uh, after you have a, now that you have a little bit of a sense of how we look at this kind of uh, review uh, of the, of the literature in terms of classifying in different classes and, and the levels of evidence, then we'll dive into the actual therapy. And this is just a graphical illustration of an NSTEMI uh, going from a pretty normal artery to the actual event of plaque rupture and uh, to the, the secondary prevention and long-term management. So in this lecture here, we're gonna really be go looking at these two right here, just to get you comfortable with some of those measures. And some of these you've already uh, seen before. So the definition, you know, what is an NMI, a uh, non-ST elevation MI? Uh, so obviously there's a cardiac specific troponin, IRT. We have high sensitivity troponin now. This uh, guidelines that I'm going through right now, they uh, don't factor that into their guidelines yet, but that will come soon. But this is looking at the traditional troponins. And, you know, it should be measured at presentation and three to six hours after symptom onset. Again, that's going to be different with the high sensitivity assays uh, in all patients with symptoms consistent with ACS. And that gives you a, a, a we spend some time looking at the different levels of evidence. That would be a 1A. And in fact, everything on this slide is, uh, is 1A, except for 
uh, here, which would be don't do it, right? So all of this is definitely do it, and this is don't do it. And that is the first one is looking at the troponin. We all know that we do that pretty routinely. And then really <clears throat> obtaining the troponin beyond six hours after symptom onset. Uh, if uh, in patients with normal troponins on serial examination, when electrocardiographic changes and or clinical presentation uh, confer an intermediate or high index of suspicion for ACS. So depending on the clinical history, uh, continuing the troponin check, we usually continue to check it until it peaks. Uh, uh, but that really validates that approach. So if the time of symptom onset is ambiguous, if, if you can't really tell from talking to the patient, then we look at the, then we consider the time of presentation in terms of dictating this timing that I'm going through here. It's so because the uh, troponin assays have become so well, we do not recommend checking CK and B and myoglobin and the diagnosis of ACS, we um, have an understanding that troponin for this particular uh, use is, is far superior, and hence we don't recommend checking the other ones for this particular reason. So immediate management. So 2A and B here, we have that it is reasonable to observe patients with symptoms consistent uh, with ACS but that don't have objective evidence of myocardial ischemia. And by that, we mean the EKG and the troponins, but they're still having pain, right? So, so what we're saying is it is reasonable uh, to continue to observe those patients in a chest pain unit or telemetry unit with serial EKGs and cardiac troponins <clears throat> in three to six hour intervals. Again, that might be a little different with high sensitivity assays. And it is reasonable for patients with possible ACS who have normal serial ECGs and cardiac troponins to have a treadmill ECG, uh, stress myocard myocardial perfusion imaging, or a stress echocardiography before discharge or within 72 hours after discharge. So these are folks that come in with chest pain, and we see them, those in the, you guys will see those in the ED very often, right? So, <clears throat> so they all come in with chest pain. It sounds that like ACS might be a reasonable uh, possibility but you're surprised by the fact that the EKGs are normal and the troponins are, are negative. So this is saying that it's reasonable to follow that up just based on the history of chest pain. And depending on the clinical picture, you might do it uh, in the hospital or in the emergency room doing a stress test uh, or ordering it from there or soon after discharge. So that's generally how we handle those patients. And then in patients with no history of CAD, uh, with chest pain, that could be consistent, but normal ECG and normal troponin is the same patient population that we've been discussing. It is reasonable to initially perform a coronary CT angiography to assess coronary artery anatomy. Now, that's level of evidence A. There's many, you know, that, that really, I think that'll turn into a 1A very soon. That there's more and more data uh, of the advantage of coronary CT and the right patient population. And it's really thought to be something that can really save um, downstream testing uh, and when used in the right context and would allow people to be discharged from the hospital, from the ED, uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, traditionally, that has been done with myocardial perfusion imaging. And that's just your, your nuclear stress test. Uh, but CT is rapidly gaining ground in, in this area. So something for you to be aware of. And that's something that is available to us uh, at Georgetown. And the ideal patient would be a patient that you don't, certainly as we have emphasized plenty of times here, normal ECG, normal cardiac troponins, uh, but then no history of CAD. So then you, you're talking about a patient that is not high risk, uh, but you might put them, uh, depending on the history of chest pain, they could potentially be an intermediate risk based on your clinical uh, suspicion. Uh, so that patient would be an ideal patient for a rule out coronary CT. And uh, the here, another 2A is uh, reasonable to give low risk patients who are referred for outpatient testing daily aspirin, sure acting nitroglycerin and other medication if appropriate with instructions about activity level and clinician follow up. Uh, so that's, you know, if, again, guided by your level of suspicion, uh, if the patient will be discharged before you really know, uh, doing this medication management until we have a sense of what might be going on. Uh, could be reasonable in the right context. 
So early hospital care, and again, this, this is going towards where you guys may be more, more active and more involved, and that's oxygen. I think we all know that patients that we think might be having a, a heart attack, that is very beneficial and that uh, to, to have supplemental oxygen administration, and that's really borne out by the data. And that's uh, particularly in the case where the saturation is less than 90%, there's respiratory distress or the high risk features of hypoxemia. So that's something that's very generally done uh, and that should be done all the time in this kind of situation. So patients with uh, uh, NSTEMI uh, with continuing pain that you deem to be ischemic. Uh, and you know, I just wanna kind of just emphasize that the, the pain that we're talking about here as we talk about these medications, is really when clinically you really feel like that's what you're dealing with. So in this case, when you're gonna be doing sublingual nitroglycerin every five minutes up to three doses, uh, after which, uh, you know, and then assessing them and seeing whether you go into a drip or not, that would be a case in which the patient's really ruled in uh, for an ACS and you are treating an end stemming, right? Uh, so that's, this is, we're really going towards a slightly different patient population than the other patient population we just talked about where the EKG was normal, the proponents were normal, but then you, just, you were just kind of working up the chest pain. This are recommendations that we're gonna go through now, starting with the oxygen and the nitroglycerin is patients that really rule in uh, with EKG is proponents and they don't have a STEMI and then you're managing an NSTEMI, which is uh, an important uh, therapeutic repertoire for you to start building, right? So yeah, so then if the sublingual nitroglycerin is not working, you're still having chest pain, then you go to intravenous nitroglycerin. This, are, this is level of evidence one, as we've talked about. And um, it sh it, so there is evidence of harm in patients that have received uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, especially within the 24 hours of subdenafil or uh, verdanafil, or within 48 hours of taladafil. So that's just something to keep in mind that uh, it's actually an increase in negative events in that context. So historical component is pretty important there. So the recommendations um, uh, for anti-ischemic anti medications, uh, so morphine, the evidence there is 2B, so it's equivocal. You know, so really, we really favor fairly strongly starting with a, uh, a nitrate if there's no contraindications. I think the setting in which I would use morphine would be if you know we're really maxing out our uh, pain management with a sublingual nitroglycerin or the IV nitroglycerin. We're still not making progress. You can use the morphine, um, and uh, particularly in the case in which there's phospho phosphodiesterase inhibitors on board. But otherwise, we would really start with a nitroglycerin. Uh, so, and so, but you could use morphine, but it's it's. As, as I mentioned, nitroglycerin is favored. The NSAIDs would be definitely do not do, uh, and they should not be initiated, and they should actually be discontinued uh, if the patient comes in with a heart attack, and uh, it's been shown to increase the risk of uh, complications in that setting. So that's something to really know and keep in mind. So then, so then we went through uh, oxygen, we went through nitroglycerin, and how that relates to morphine. Uh, we went through stopping the NSAIDs, right? Now we're going to the beta blockers. So this is class 1A to start oral beta blockers as long as you don't have contraindications for to doing so. And some of those could be uh, elongated PR interval, uh, high degree AV block, asthma that's active, right? Not just an incidental history of asthma, but, but um, somebody with active asthma or reactive airway disease that's active already, not just a historical uh, point. In addition, uh, with concomitant um, uh, NSTEMI, stabilized heart failure, reduced uh, systolic function, generally I'd recommend um, to continue the three drugs that have actually been shown to reduce mortality in patients with heart failure. So that, just so you guys know, and that's something that we often ask you guys, when you're around with us is what are the beta blockers? What are, what are the beta blockers that have specifically been shown to confer advantage in the setting of heart failure? And they are uh, the toprol, that's the sustained release metoprol succinate, rather than tartrate, which would be the short acting, carvedilol or bisoprolol. So, you know, initially you might start, uh, as we are 
we're talking about within the, the initial dose might be amitopril tartrate, uh, just a short acting, but then you want to move into one of the medications that have been shown uh, to be effective in heart failure for people that have uh, a reduced EF in that context. All right, so let me know if you guys have any questions so far, but I think we've covered the beta blockers as well. Uh, we don't run into, we don't, it's not very frequent where we run into a situation in which we cannot use beta blockers, but it's important to know that there are other options if you can't. So for patients that is level one, is for patients that have a documented contraindication is to reassess within the first day uh, to see if that, uh, whatever the contraindication might have been, whether that's still present. Uh, and uh, a 2A would be to continue beta blocker therapy even in the context of normal LV function, the setting of active SDS, and that makes sense in terms of heart rate control and decreased demand and things along those lines, right? So the administration of IV beta blockers is potentially harmful uh, in this context, uh, particularly in patients with evidence of shock. And that's a big change and something for you guys to know about, you know, the, the guidelines changed. It was IV beta blocker that was given before, and because of this data showing uh, increased harm has really uh, gone to PL beta blockade. So not IV beta blockers, PO beta blockers. You can start with short acting uh, PO beta blockers, and if you have uh, LV dysfunction, you can move on to uh, one of the other beta blockers that I mentioned before. So yeah, so then we have, um, you know, we're down to our beta blockers now. Uh, we've been through pain management and oxygen as well. And uh, just something to know, just a little word about the calcium channel blockers. Again, it's not very frequent that we end up using them instead of the beta blockers, but it's important to know, for you to know that that is an option if you need it. And uh, the ones that we're specifically talking about is verapamil or diltiazem. Uh, the other calcium channel blockers, so you're looking at non dihydropyridine so those are the ones that control heart rate, not blood pressure. So for you guys to know that that would be what you would use um, as a replacement to a beta blocker. And uh, you just have to be careful, they're negative inotropes, and if they're significantly decreased LV, function, then you really don't want to use them because that would be detrimental in that context. Uh, but, you know, so, so the right context would be if somebody, for example, had very bad reactive airway disease, uh, particularly in, in conjunction with their end stemming. Uh, so that might be a person that you use a calcium channel blocker as long as they don't have any other contraindications. Okay. So, yeah, this is very similar as well. So, so, you know, in addition to beta blockade, in addition to pain control, in addition to oxygen supplementation, we obviously have the high intensity statins and that's level evidence 1A. Uh, so that is to be started in all patients with end stemmies uh, and obviously folks that don't have contraindications for doing so. And uh, obtaining a fasting lipid profile in patients with end stemmy, that's 2A. Uh, preferably within the first 24 hours of presentation. Uh, just so that, you know, I, I, you know, that's something that uh, is done uh, and it's something that is worth checking also on follow-up. So I, I think I agree with the recommendation to check it at the at presentation, but it's important to check it on follow-up as well, just to see, because invariably they would have been started on uh, one medication or another. It's good to see what, the, what kind of effect you had on follow-up from that. So this you may not be as familiar with. You know, I think that maybe most people knew about the beta blockers, knew about the statin, obviously nitroglycerin. Um, I added to use that in preference of morphine, which you guys may or may not have heard about. But uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, inhibition of that system has been shown to be very beneficial in the context of ACS. Uh, and that is something that uh, not everybody appreciates, and that's why I wanted to put this in here. So particularly when you have an EF of less than 40% and uh, you know that they not only should be started in the acute setting, but that they should be continued, uh, particularly in patients with hypertension, diabetes, stable CKD, uh, unless they're contraindicated. So if there's an intolerance to ACE inhibition, uh, we can do a nigrotensin receptor blocker, as you guys know, both of these are 1A recommendations. Something that you may not know, and this is also a 1A recommendation, uh, is the aldosterone blockade. And it is recommended in patients post-MI 
uh, without significant renal dysfunction. So this is the creatinine, the creatinine uh, uh, levels here uh, and hyperkalemic. So those are two things that are side effects of uh, aldosterone blockade, obviously. So uh, in patients who are receiving therapeutic doses of ACE inhibitor, and a beta blocker or ARB if the ACE inhibitor is, is not indicated and have an EF of 40% or less diabetes mellitus or heart failure. So that's something that uh, is recommended in the acute setting as well, uh, particularly uh, as the patient's medication regimen is being optimized prior to discharge. So if you do start one of these and they do have to have a potassium checked within a couple of weeks, just to ensure that there isn't um, the hyperkalemia side effect that is well known with the aldosterone blockade. And, and then this, then now we go to the anticoagulation. So anticoagulation uh, in this setting starts with aspirin and it's either 162 milligrams or 325. And that's a 1A recommendation. We're all aware of that. It's very well validated by data. The thing that you guys may not know about it, so you don't have to start, you don't have to keep at that level. You start with the first dose, but then a baby aspirin of 81 after that, uh, which should be continued indefinitely, by the way, uh, then uh, that's reasonable rather than the higher doses. And that's been shown to be, to be the case, that you don't need the higher doses as um, maintenance therapy. In folks that are unable, folks that have ACS and they're unable to take aspirin because of hypersensitivity or major GI issues, uh, something that can be done is use uh, uh, clopidogrel, just do a loading dose and daily maintenance. And obviously part of what I'm gonna tell you is using aspirin and clopidogrel. So in the case that there is an allergy to, to aspirin then you use two monotherapy with, with clopidogrel. Uh, so, you know, the uh, uh, clopidogrel uh, was the start, the, the initial medication that we used to do for uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. Tacaglor has really become something that we tend to prefer, uh, but there are the issues of one being older, one being newer, and there's cost implications, as you guys know. So I think either, you know, and that's a 1B, either of them is just fine. Uh, and uh, that it should be given in addition to aspirin in this patient population, and it should be administered for up to 12 months in the patients with an NSTEMI. And uh, as long as it are not, uh, there are no contraindications. You know, another difference between the clopidogrel and the tacagrelor is the dosing. Uh, the maintenance dose for uh, clopidogrel is, is 75 daily, tacagrelor is 90 milligrams twice daily, right? So compliance is another consideration in terms of which one you decide to use. And um, you'll have that institutions have their preferred method and you'll get a sense of what that is. Uh, but either of them, according to the guidelines, is acceptable. But something to keep an eye out for is the fact that this is different in the context of ACS. We're talking a different situation than somebody who's going in for an elective PCI. You go for an elective PCI and you have a stent put in. The stents are getting better and better in terms of instant thrombosis. And then uh, you are generally not needing to do very long periods of dual antiplatelet therapy. And, uh, but the exception there is that if it's ACS, the data still bears the, really supports the fact that it should be dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months in that particular setting. So, so then, yes, we, we talked about, you know, whether, you know, what the preference is, you know, so people that are actually going for stenting uh, early on rather than the ischemia guided therapy, uh, the tacagrelor uh, is actually preference to clopidogrel. But again, you know, I think both can, as I mentioned before, both can be used. And uh, if, we're, if you will do an uh, uh, early invasive strategy uh, and dual antiplatelet therapy uh, with intermediate to high risk features, there's uh, GP2B3A inhibitors that can be considered as an additive and that's evidence to be, so not, not, not so strong. <clears throat> so in patients uh, with an uh, NSTEMI, in addition to dual antiplatelet therapy, there's the recommendation for systemic anticoagulation. And it's important to know that there's many different options. And this is, by the way, a level of evidence 1A. And by the way, in the context of an NSTEMI, the duration of this uh, systemic anticoagulation is 48 hours. That's what the studies have borne out. Uh, so, you know, if you have a situation in which the patient gets a stent 
uh, before those 48 hours, then obviously, as long as their disease has, has been addressed, you don't have to continue that. Uh, but uh, Lovenox is one option. Uh, Bivalirudin is another option. Fondaparinox, another option as well. And unfractionary heparin is another option. So you will see that, uh, that which one you use really depends on the institution. Uh, people will have preferences based on institutional preference and experience, uh, but you can see that they, they can all be used based on the data and the evidence. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting point here in terms of at level three, in terms of do no harm, is that in patients with end STEMI, with, uh, without ST elevation, without a true posterior MI, without a left bundle branch block that is new in the right setting, that intravenous fibrinolytic therapy should not be used. So in your standard end STEMI, you really shouldn't be using uh, lytics. Um, you know, so that's just something to keep in mind unless you have a, a, a strong clinical reason to do so. And this is just summarizing what we've been through here. Uh, so if we're going to do a um, ischemia guided therapy, you know, this is just so that you know the different, you know, within, so obviously when you talk about our STEMI, we do the most early of invasive strategies, right? If you have an STEMI that has more high risk features and that you feel clinically needs to be acted upon, sooner rather than later, and we can go through what those scenarios might be. That would be the early invasive strategy. The ischemia guided strategy, uh, then is, is folks that you feel clinically uh, don't have to be acted upon uh, right there and then, right? So these are the differences between the two strategies, but you see there's a lot of overlap there, right? Uh, everybody's getting aspirin, everybody's getting a P2Y12 inhibitor, everybody's getting an anticoagulant of some form or another. Uh, in the very high risk uh, patients, you might consider it to be 3A inhibitor, but the data for that is not great, uh, but it could be done. So, and then um, you can see as we continue down, you see there's, there's uh, some of the difference here. Uh, uh, if you have PCI with stenting, then obviously you continue with the anticoagulation uh, regimen as described. If you have cabbage, then it's a little bit different. Uh, first of all, uh, for cabbage, you need to stop the clopidogrel or tacagrelor five days prior. Or we didn't talk about prasugrel, but it's a uh, stronger uh, to PY12 inhibitor. And uh, we need to stop that one at least seven days prior uh, to elective cabbage. So discontinuing these medications up to 24 hours, if it's an urgent cabbage, could be acceptable depend, uh, depending on the surgeon. And then the uh, 2B3A inhibitor uh, two to four hours prior to the cabbage. And, and in the late hospital care, um, you know, there, there isn't, I mean, if you, if you had cabbage or PCI in the setting of an end STEMI, uh, then you have to have the dual antiplatelet therapy for the full 12 months, as we talked about, regardless of whether you had cabbage or PCI. So that's an important component because generally speaking, if you go for elective cabbage, uh, you, don't, you don't do uh, dual antiplatelet therapy unless there, there's been also a stent, a recent stent as well. So but just for uh, bypass surgery, what you would do is indefinite aspirin. But in the context that uh, this uh, was done for an end STEMI, and, uh, then it would, that would be different. You would have, as mandated by the guidelines, the 12 hours, I mean the 12, year, uh, 12 months of the <clears throat> dual antiplatelet therapy. So, yeah, so that's a pretty good overview of where we are uh, from, from a treatment uh, standpoint. Uh, and um, I'm going to say just a little bit about early invasive versus ischemia guided. I alluded to this already. Uh, but so urgent, immediate invasive strategy, and that's just going for the cath lab, obviously not an end STEMI, not a STEMI, but within the context of an end STEMI. Uh, is really reserved for folks that have refractory angina, hemodynamic or electrical instability. Uh, and it's just those folks that although they're not having a STEMI, they're really just not doing very well clinically. And we think that's because of their ongoing STEMI. Uh, 
So those are the folks that would go to the cath lab sooner rather than later. Uh, and uh, an early invasive strategy is indicated initially <clears throat> in stabilized patients uh, who, uh, you know, their condition changes or have developed other risks uh, that initially were not uh, observed. So that's the, so generally speaking, invasive in the context of an STEM is dictated by the clinical condition. So an early invasive strategy is not recommended in patients in whom the risk of revascularization uh, are likely to outweigh the benefits of revascularization. So sometimes you have folks that, you know, they have a massive GI bleed and a life-threatening GI bleed is one example, right? Uh, so in that context, you wouldn't want to subject that patient to being on aspirin or Plavix after having the stent put in, if, if you can avoid it, obviously. Obviously, people with chest pain that has a low likelihood of being ACS, we wouldn't recommend that either. So appropriate selection in terms of how, how much you weight and how you address this, um, just to give you an overview. As we talked about refractory angina, hemodynamic compromise, some new, new heart failure or worsening heart failure. Those are things that would uh, merit in the context of an NSTEMI, a more immediate invasive strategy. Uh, ischemia guided strategy would be a situation in which the patient is having an NSTEMI but is deemed to not be as high risk. Uh, and then there's also the category of uh, delayed invasive. Uh, and that's uh, folks that, uh, again, are deemed to be able to wait a little longer clinically and, um, there are other factors that might lead you in that direction. For example, if you have renal insufficiency and you're uh, hoping that the creatinine is improved uh, uh, by whatever interventions you're doing, so that, that would be a, an indication uh, for that as well. 